اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين ثم اما بعد الله لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم لا تاخذه سنه ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الارض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده الا باذنه يعلم ما بين ايديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه الا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والارض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين ثم اما بعد once again everybody assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh inshallah the intention today is a pretty tall order i'm going to try to go through not all the observations i've ever studied on surah or on ayatul kursi but a good number of them inshallah and uh, because we have a tall order i'm not going to spend a lot of time on introduction i want to get right into the material uh, bi'ithnillah there are just just the minimal introduction i can give you is that ayatul kursi is made up of nine beautiful declarations there are nine sentences nine teachings you can say that allah azza wa jalla gives us in this one you know massive ayah all of them going back to him they're all about himself and the starting point of all of it is actually the arabic word ilah which is part of the first sentence allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum so we're going to discuss that word a little bit first get a grasp of it and then talk about the word allah and then keep keep going bin bismillah ta'ala so that first word ilah in arabic which is commonly translated like we say la ilaha illallah there's no god except allah right so the word ilah is commonly translated as god but it's actually a very profound deep and heavy word of the arabic language uh, the word ilah from alaha ya'lahu actually means to worship and because of it some have taken the word ilah and translated it as ma'bud in arabic which means the object of worship meaning that's when they translate there's no one worthy of worship except allah that's what it comes from when they when they look at it as alaha ya'lahu ilahan but there is a subtle difference between them in the arabic language when you say ma'bud you're saying someone who deserves to be worshiped or someone that is worshiped when you say ilah it's a, what's called an infinitive a mustar which means worship itself and the equivalent of that from the same origin would have been the word ma'lu the one to be worshiped but instead of saying ma'lu allah says ilah now what does that do it actually suggests that there is no actual worship ever being done unless it's being done for allah like worship in its true nature is only really done when it's done for allah there is, you know so you're not just saying there's no god except allah you're actually saying nobody's actually truly even experienced what worship means unless they've done it for allah they may have had some spiritual experiences they may have had some rituals that they participated in but allah is making this bold statement that you haven't experienced god like you should have or spirituality like you should have unless it was dedicated to allah azza wa jalla himself the second meaning of ilah comes from aliha ila fulanin and that actually in the arabic language means to find peace in someone to find contentment in someone to turn to someone when you're sad or overwhelmed that's why it's parallel with faza'a ila fulanin aw wuli'a bi fulanin to be you know to be desperate for someone also the word ilah actually means the one the, you're not going to find any peace anywhere except with allah you're not going to find contentment anywhere else except allah there's no one to run to or turn to in desperation except allah allah is the only companionship you'll ever possibly have that's within the meanings of ilah you know when we just translate it as there's no one worthy of worship except allah we just skip over all these beautiful meanings then the implication of aliha is also tahayyara to be amazed or overwhelmed or be in awe of someone and so la ilaha illa allah actually one of its implications is there's nothing to be in awe of nothing to be amazed by like allah is like nothing in life will ever overwhelm you and and put you in humility like allah azza wa jalla will and then of course as we go further the, my, one of my favorite meanings and that's where we're all, our discussion about ilah will actually begin some scholars of language actually argue that aliha or ilah doesn't come from hamza lam and ha like a la ha it actually comes from wala wow lam and ha and that's what's called ibdal in arabic the wow can turn into a hamza and that could come from multiple origins when you say it's waliha uh, or waliha yalahu that actually means to have desperate or intense love for someone and it's a, it's one of the brands of love that I'll talk to you about in a second but it's actually to be overwhelmed in love so much so that you don't even feel any pain even if you are in pain you don't feel hunger even if you are in hunger like that that love itself becomes your appetite that's what fulfills you so with that little bit of an introduction of what the word ilah suggests 
Allah is not introducing Himself when He calls Himself Ilah as just a God. That's one of the base meanings of it. But He's someone that you turn to in desperation, someone that you have intense love for, someone that you turn to when you're looking for peace and contentment, someone that in your most desperate of times is going to be there for you, and of course the, the incredible object of your love. Now the Arabs, back in the day, they were really obsessed with this idea of love. And they had lots of words for it. Actually, I'll give you a list. Al-Hawa, Al-Sabwa, Al-Shaghaf, Al-Wajd, Al-Kalaf, Al-Ishq, Al-Najwa, Al-Shawq, Al-Wasab, Al-Istikana, Al-Wud, Al-Khulla, Al-Gharam, Al-Hub, Al-Walah, Al-Hiyam. Actually, I used to think there were nine or ten levels of love. I actually found that there were fourteen in the Arabic language. Fourteen degrees of love. And each one of them suggests something. Like the lowest, the least of love, they say, is Hawa, which is like when you lust someone. It's just a base kind of love, meaning you're just physically you know, impressed with somebody and there's nothing more to it than that. And it keeps building from there, right? So for example, Al-Wajd, one of the degrees of love, I won't go through all of them. Um, maybe another seminar on just love, inshallah. But Al-Wajd uh, is, for example, when you really miss someone, when that love makes you really miss somebody, then you have Al-Wajd, you know? When that love becomes heavy on your heart, it's called Al-Kalaf, like it's like a burden you're carrying. That's another degree of love. You know, a najwa is actually a kind of love that you have to keep secret because it keeps showing on your face. Like you can't even hide it that you're you're just you know completely and absolutely in love. Um, al istikana is the kind of love that makes you feel paralyzed. You can't even get out of bed just thinking about it. It's it, it overwhelms you, you know. And so of these degrees of love, when you go all the way to the end, let's let me take you all the way to the last degree of love that the Arabs believe is the last degree of love. They all actually call it al hiyam, and al hiyam in Arabic is from uh, the verb hama, which is used for camels when they're looking for water, when they run out of water, and they're wandering in the desert looking for water. And they're aimlessly, they go a few steps this way, then they go a few steps that way, then they go a few steps that way. Aimless wandering, looking for water, that's called hama. It's the expression, for example, hama fi kulli wadin, somebody's wandering like a crazy person aimlessly in this direction or that direction. In other words, they argue that the Last degree of love is the one that drives you insane and renders you completely useless. You, you're just, you're, you've gone crazy. So that's the last one, which means it's not healthy, it's actually annihilation. It's self-annihilation, that's him. One less than that, so it's the last one will kill you, but the, the last one that's still healthy, the one that you can still, that you can have and it's the most intense you can have, is actually al-wala. Al-wala is the kind of love that makes you feel no pain that fulfills you even in the most desperate and void of times when everything else is going wrong so long as you have this love you feel like you don't need anything else all your other needs are, uh, have been satisfied and that's from the origin of the word ilah so when for example some Christian friends come and tell me our God is love but your God is not love you believe in Allah and he's not uh, well actually he's our ilah which actually suggests that he is the most intense love that can ever be experienced, you know. Then you, it just changes your perspective on Allah will be enough for you. Allah will be enough for you. Like Allah in the sense of even the love that is going to fulfill your life will be enough for you. So it, it begins with, just summarizing, it begins with the object of worship and it goes on to all these other things. But now, Ayatul Kursi does not begin with La ilaha illallah. It begins Allahu La ilaha illa huwa. It's a different organization a little bit. There's an additional word even if you don't know the Arabic language. There's the word Allah in the beginning, and then there's the word Huwa at the end again. You could just make this shorter and just say, La ilaha illallah. Right? But Allah put the word Allah as the subject of this sentence, the mubtada of this sentence, and then the khabar of it is a sentence by itself. Let's understand why that happens. If you remember a few minutes ago, I told you that this ayah is made up of nine declarations. And each one of them is actually a continuation of the word Allah. So the word Allah, there are nine sentences in the ayah. And I want you to think, let's think about this in English for a second. For each of those nine sentences, the first word in that sentence is the word Allah, even if you don't say it. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. Allahu la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Allahu lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil It's like that. For each one of those statements, you first think of the word Allah and then that statement. Then the word Allah and then that statement. Then the word Allah and then that statement. So Allah becomes the subject of all nine of the declarations that are coming. 
So we're going to put, and that's the, the benefit of putting the word Allah in the beginning like that, is that's what it does. It actually allows us to think of each one of those as a continuation, like as if here are the nine things you need to know about Allah. Allah, so and so and such and such and such. And Allah, such and such and such. Allah, such and such and such. It's really beautiful that Allah did that, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And so now, and, and what's amazing about that also, is notice, Allah, there is no one worthy of worship, obedience, love, to find contentment and peace in, except He. That's the word ilah, right? But notice in that sentence, when I tried to translate it, I said, except He. I used the pronoun He. For each one of these nine sentences, the pronoun that goes back to Allah will keep coming up. Meaning the style, the signature of Allah in these nine sentences is, they start with the word Allah, and somehow or the other, they mention Allah as a pronoun again. Allah, that's who He is. لا تأخذوا هو سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات ما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده هو إلا بإذنه يعلم has the word هو in it ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه له هو again السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم سبحان الله every one of them goes back to Allah يعود إلى الله عز وجل keeps going back keeps going back keeps going back and the thing is in Arabic, they say, الضميرُ يَعُودُ إِلَى الْأَقْرَبِ The pronoun, when you use the word he, it goes back to a noun. The only noun here is Allah. And that's how they, they all keep going back to Allah Azza wa Jal. So now, when he makes this absolute declaration, there's not even such a thing as finding peace except Allah. There's no such thing as finding love, true love except Allah. There's no such thing as finding, finding fulfillment except Allah. There's no such thing as actual worship except Allah. No one to be worshipped except Allah. And even these, these notions of love, fulfillment, peace, Allah is making this incredible statement. Not only is He the object of these things, but these experiences in and of themselves you've never had except with Allah. Everything you've had is just a fraction. The real thing is only when you find Allah. And that is who He is. That's the first thing He wanted us to know about Him. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa. La ilaha illa huwa. And so about now himself, he's going to continue to describe. This first statement is now going to conclude with two of his names. He decides to give us the two names Al-Hay and Al-Qayyum. Al-Hay, Al-Qayyum. Which, you know, they, it's tough to translate. You know, Al-Hay can be translated as the living. Right, that's an easy translation. And Al-Qayyum, the maintainer, the caretaker. And so we're going to dig into each of these words a little bit. So we appreciate how these things are now coming together. فَالتَّعْرِفُ بِأَلْ هِيَ دَلَالَةٌ عَلَى الْكَمَالِ وَالْقَصْرِ لِأَنَّ مَا سِوَاهُ يُصِيبُهُ الْمَوْتِ the, the, the Al in Al Hay, you heard the word Al when you said Allah la ilaha illa huwa Al Hayyu Al Qayyum. That Al actually suggests something that is perfect or complete. And it also suggests that something other than Him is missing it. And that the reason the word Al Hay, the living, is used in the sense that the absolute source of life and the one truly living is Allah, every other thing that exists that has life. I have life, plants have life, animals can have life. Everything else that has life is missing something in it. Because it will be, it, it'll be struck down by death. Eventually it will all be struck down by death. And eventually, and at one point, all of those things were dead to begin with. Kuntum amwatan, you used to be dead to begin with. Right? But Allah, when He says Al-Hay, there was never any death that was a part of Him nor will death ever be experienced by him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created the institution of death. In a sense, he even distinguished himself, him being the ultimately living, from everything besides him. It's also, and when we combine these two words, I'll share some more things with you. We're not believing in a God that just is all-powerful, or some force, you know, like Star Wars style, the force is with you, or some unseen thing that kind of you can manipulate and use. and. You know, it's like a machine or a program or some kind of consciousness or whatever. This is actually a living being. He's, he's full of life, you know. He's not just a machine. Like some people say, well, I don't believe in God, but I believe in nature. Or I believe in the force. Or I believe in the universe, you know. Or I be believe in the laws of nature. These laws that are blind, that don't have a consciousness, that just govern themselves. They, they're just free-floating things, you know. Or philosophers would believe in abstract ideas that have no consciousness. Allah Azza wa Jal describes Himself as al hay saying, how can you actually experience love, adoration? Human beings, when they find peace in someone, when they desperately turn to someone, when they have a relationship with someone, when they love someone, it would have to be someone living. It would have to be. The first statement, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa, is invalid if you're, it's directed to someone who doesn't even have life. 
it, w- it wouldn't necessarily have to be someone who possesses life, you know. Even when people worship stones, idols, they actually believe behind this idol is someone living. If they genuinely believed all this is a stone, they wouldn't be able to worship it. They'd have to attribute some kind of life to it. Allah says, why go for some form of life or another? Go for the source of all life, Al-Hay. Al-Hay. And so he adds to that the incredible thing, just because he's, just because someone is alive, doesn't mean they care. That's two different things. You can worship someone or, let's not talk about worship, let's take a lesser example. You believe in the power of a king, he's alive, as he has, still has authority, but that doesn't mean the king cares for you. Just because you accept his authority as the king doesn't mean that he's going to take care of his subjects. Those are two different things. When he says al qayyum he actually adds his attribute that not only is he living, that he actually takes care. And it's a pretty interesting word to use in combination with al-hayy. Because if he's living, the first thought would have been that he'll hear my prayers. He'll hear when I ask him for help. He'll hear when I plea, when I'm in need. But before you get to even mention your need, he says, I'm taking care of you. al qayyum like, whether you ask or not, I'm still taking care of you. There are people who never ask Allah anything. Allah still takes care of every heartbeat they have. Allah still takes care of every breath they take. He's still qayyum to them without them even asking. He is al-hayy like no one else. You know, when you, when you found out that Allah is al-hayy, and you turn to Him in desperation, by, in, in the first sentence, or the, the, in the first part of this sentence, when you said, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa, when you turn to Him as ilah, if you turn to anybody else in desperation, they won't know your needs until you ask. Until you come before them, you know, and they may, may not ever be able to take care of you until you express. There are people who even love you, and they're hurting you. There are people who love you and they're hurting you, and until you let them know ah, you're actually hurting me, they'll say, "I had no idea I was hurting you. I had no clue. Why didn't you say this sooner?" Until we express, it's not there. Sometimes we feel neglected. They're like, "I don't think you're taking care of me. I don't think you're taking care of what you're supposed to." And you have to bring it to the attention of the one who's neglectful. But Allah, remarkably subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's establishing the foundations of my relationship with Him. He is alive, which means He's constantly there. And he's, you're not just speaking into thin air. You know, your, pray, your, your pleas are being answered and someone is listening. But even when you're not asking, He's constantly taking care. So now let's dig into this word, Al-Qayyum. Sigatul Mubalagha ala wazanin. على وزن غير مشهور ومن معاني الكلمة القائم في تدبير أمر خلقه في إنشائهم وتدبيرهم. It's actually a hyperbolized form of the word. قائم is maintainer. قائم is maintainer. Uh, someone who maintains repeatedly is قوام. Like الرجال قوامون على النساء. The word قوام. But قيوم is actually فيعول, which is very rare use of the Arabic language. You, you know, making some, some words spell like this, qayyum, like that, it's not a normal thing in Arabic to do. So it's a mubalagha, it is a hyperbole, but it's not a usual one. And that's Allah's way of telling us that Allah is taking care in, way that it, in a way that is unusual, unprecedented, you know. The closest thing to this word that comes in the Qur'an is actually used for people, and it's used for men who take care of women. Rijal qawamuna ala nisa like sons take care of their mothers, or you know, they take care of older parents and things like that, or you take care of your daughters, or you take care of the spouse, or you take care of the women in your family, etc. That's qawamuna ala nisa Because you maintain and you make sure they're doing okay. You make sure they're not starving, you make sure they're safe and things like that. You know? Whose job is it to make sure all the doors are locked at night? Or to make sure everybody's at home? Or they're, they're not, you know, if, if somebody's not calling you back, your sister's not calling you back, and you're worried about where are you, you know? or somebody's traveling, who's going to make sure everything's going okay? It's the men of the family. They're the qawam, but not qayyum. In other words, Allah takes care in ways that even creation can't. And so He says, Al-qa'imu fi tadbiri amri khalqihi It's someone who takes care of the, the planning. And every not, in, not only did Allah maintain or design how we were created, but He also maintains our entire plan for how we're going to live. Lay it all out. That's part of his, Him being Al-qayyum. Al-Qa'imu ala kulli shay also means the one overseeing everything. Al-Qayyum, you know, extremely vigilantly overlooking everything constantly. You know, it reminds me of a phrase in Arabic. It's used in Ali Imran for when somebody owes somebody money. Right? Somebody owes somebody money and they're not paying them back. And the guy who wants his money back keeps calling, keeps calling, keeps calling, shows up at the door. He's like harassing the guy. إِلَّا مَا دُمْتَ عَلَيْهِ قَائِمًا 
until you stand constantly over him, just over, just standing over him like, hey, come on, come on, come on. So you, there's this harassment necessary, vigilance necessary to get your money back from that guy. You have to stay on his case over and over and over again. That's the word qa'im. Allah Azza wa Jal uses the word al-qayyum. And in it, there's an interesting imagery. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى We're just talking about imagery right now. Qa'im actually means standing. Qa'im means standing. When someone's standing over something and watching something, and, or taking care of something, and when someone's sitting down and taking care of something, there's a difference. If I was, for example, asked to take responsibility and watch over something, and I'm just sitting back and watching, that actually means I'm not as actively involved. If I'm standing over, it actually shows I'm more vigilant, more active. That's why Al-Qa'im, الَّذِي لَا يَنْعَسْ وَلَا يَنَامْ لِأَنَّهُ لَوْ كَانَ ذَلِكْ لَا يَكُونُ قَيُّومًا وَقَدْ يَكُونُ قَائِمًا The one who doesn't get exhausted, doesn't get sleepy or drowsy. You know, like a, think of a security guard. We'll get to that analogy a little later too. Think of a security guard. He's sitting back, supposed to be watching the, the lobby or whatever. When you sit for a while, what happens? I've gone to plenty of buildings where the security guards like, you know, earning a passive income, literally, you know, like, <laughs> you know. The idea of qa'im is someone who's watching over something vigilantly. But even when someone's standing, is it possible someone's standing and still dozing off? Does that happen? Sure. That's not possible if you call someone qayyum though. Because the mubalagha keeps it from being passive, keeps it from being lackadaisical. It's like a Someone who really, truly watches over, diligently watches over, cares for, maintains, and does so consistently in a way that nobody else does. That's the meaning of Al-Qayyum. But now if you combine these two, Allahu la ilaha illahu wa al hay Al-Qayyum. There's no point accepting someone as ilah if they're not living. I already made that point. And there's still no point accepting someone as ilah and they're living if they don't care. Like if they don't maintain or take care of you, or take care of things around you, why would you even want to worship them? Like it's, you know, and, and it, they're alive but incapable, or alive or insensitive. Allah Azza wa Jal combined both, al hay al qayyum And the other interesting thing, this, this statement that He's the living, and He's the one who takes care. If there were, the mushrikun were challenged by this statement, because if you have other gods that you think are alive, you have other gods that you think take care of your business, they should be so offended by this statement from Allah that He's the only one who does this. That they should stand up and they should send their own messages. They should challenge Allah. They should send their own miracles. They should convince their patrons of their own legitimacy. No one stands when Allah says, Al Hayyul Qayyum. Everybody's lack of, every false god's lack of life and every false god's inability to be Al Qayyum becomes established just in that statement. Because nobody ever comes to challenge it. So now, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. We move along to the second statement. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Drowsiness doesn't grab a hold of him, neither does sleep. That's a rough translation of لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. السنة النعاس من غير النوم والوسنان من من ليس بمستغرق في نومه. They say in Arabic, sina, uh, which is from the Arabic origin wasan, is when you are kind of sleeping but not truly sleeping. It's kind of like some people that are listening to this right now. They're like they're coming in and out of consciousness. That is sinna. When you're totally out and the person next to you can hear you snore, that's gnome. Gnome is when you're inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You're done. You know, down for the count. But when you're still kind of nodding off a little bit, they say ya'khuduhu ghashiyun ya'khudu al-insan bi waqtin qasir. Uh, something that, you know, kind of overtakes a person for a short period of time. You know? Like if you're driving and it's been really late night and for a second you kind of, oh, it just happened. That was actually sina. Someone's been awa awake and active and, you know, over caring for something, taking care of something. What's natural to happen? They get tired. Allah just described Himself as alive. Then Allah described Himself as someone who actively takes care. By the way, he doesn't even mention what he takes care of. Let me say, al qayyum ala khalqihi. You know, the, the maintainer over all of his creation. He didn't say that. He just said the, the maintainer. In other words, he maintains things that you can think of. He maintains things you can't even think of. He maintains things in the seen. He maintains things in the unseen. He maintain, th maintains things inside of you and outside of you. It's an unlimited 
number of applications when someone's taking care. Now, the thing is, the, the, the appreciation of Allah, the true appreciation of Allah, is in actually acknowledging what He does in comparison to what we're capable of doing. That's the real appreciation of Allah. Whenever He gives Himself a name, He gives Himself an attribute, you'll notice a lot of those names, you can actually give those names to yourself too. Allah is, for example, Al-Hakim, the wise. There are people that have wisdom. Allah is Alim, the knowledgeable. There are people that have knowledge. Allah, for example, is Rahim. There are people that have mercy. His names. Sometimes people share those names. But when you start to imagine what people do with these attributes, how much, how far are they able to go? And then what Allah does, then you realize how supreme Allah is above His creation. وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِهِ You know? So how far above? He makes us realize how far above His creation He is. So let's compare for a second. We're not talking about Allah now, we're talking about our own weakness. Someone's taking care of something. You're taking care of business, family, home, a sick member of the family in the hospital. You're taking care of all kinds of things. What happens eventually? You need to sleep or no? You, t- you get tired or no? Somebody says, oh, you know, my, my cousin's in the ER, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna stand, I'm sit right next to him. Uh, you know, no, 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 I don't need to sit, I'll stand. You'll stand for one hour, two hours, three, eventually what are you gonna do? You're gonna sit down. And when you're gonna sit down, no, 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 I don't need to sleep, I don't need to sleep. The nurse will say, hey, you wanna lie down on the couch? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Eventually, no matter how badly you wanna take care, you wanna watch over, what's gonna happen to you? Whether you like it or not, you're gonna fall asleep. Allah says, لا تأخذه سنتون even drowsiness doesn't get a hold of him. Forget sleep. That's why sleep is mentioned second. Obviously the first step towards sleep is drowsiness, exhaustion. That doesn't even ever touch him. Then how can sleep? So now he's a, he's a maintainer and a caretaker that is not only willing, but also capable like no one else. No one else has that capability of taking care of us the way that Allah Azza wa Jal does without exhaustion. ذَكَرَ السَّنَا قَبْلَ النَّوْمَ I mentioned that لَمْ يَضَعْ لَامَ التَّعْرِيفِ That's the other interesting thing. لا تأخذه سِنَا تُنْ وَلَا نَوْمٌ As opposed to السِّنَا and النَّوْمْ ال, The ALs are missing. Previously you saw الحي القيوم Now you see them missing. In the negation when they're missing, what, mean, what that means is even the least bit of drowsiness, even the least possibility of sleep isn't, isn't ever going to get a hold of him. The least of it is this denied. This is the perfection of the language of Quran. If you say, لا تأخذه السنة ولنّو If you put al on it, then drowsiness in the, in the worst sense, in the absolute sense, doesn't get a hold of him. But that means some, in some sense it might. Or like total sleep doesn't get him. When you say total sleep doesn't get him, you might be suggesting, well, partial sleep might. So he's actually using the most minimal of the forms to, to let us know that the, there's no possibility of sina or no, meaning drowsiness or sleep. Now I want you to remember where the sentence begins. The beginning of this second sentence is not لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. The beginning of the sentence is the word Allah. Allah لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Allah, nothing grabs a hold of him. Allah, exclamation, no drowsiness grabs a hold of him, nor does any sleep whatsoever. When you put Allah in the beginning like that, this is what you call فَذَلِكَ يُشِيرُ إِلَىٰ إِثْبَاتِ غَيْرِ الْفَاعِلِ It actually alludes to other than Allah. Allah in fact, none of this ever happens to him. By comparison, it will happen to all else. And that will remind you of how, how perfect Allah is. And that will actually remind you of the first statement. That is truly being al hay Because everything else experiences sleep. And when they experience sleep, we know sleep is a form of what? Of death. Of death. And when you're sleeping, you can't take care of anything. You can't be qa'im. Forget qayyum. So Allah is proving how He is. He can only be al hayul qayyum in the statement, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. You people can't. No one else can. And so, now you get to just... This is a little bit of an observation about the language of the Qur'an. But I think it's important to mention. لو قال لا تأخذه سنة ونوم. If you say sleep, uh, uh, drowsiness and sleep, don't get a hold of him. Listen carefully to the English. Forget the Arabic for a second. Drowsiness and sleep don't catch him. When you say it like that, the, the word I put in between was and. Drowsiness and sleep don't catch him. You know what that does? It's problematic. It actually means when they both come together, they don't bother him. But if they come separately, they might. 
You see? For example, if I say, I don't like fries and ketchup. If I say that. That still means I might like fries and mustard. I, ugh. But anyway, you know, some people, you know, strange. Actually, the French have it with mayonnaise or something. Weird. Or they did some, some, I don't know what they had, but they offered me fries. And I said, I'm in France, I need to have French fries. So they, and they said, oh, you mean freedom fries? It's like, don't be smart about it. We're over the Bush era, thank you. But they gave me fries, but they didn't have ketchup. They had some mustard thing. I'm like, so when you say, I don't like fries and ketchup, that doesn't actually mean you don't like, that it still could mean you still like fries. You just don't like the combination. If you say, sleep, your drowsiness and sleep doesn't catch Allah. That's a problematic statement because that you could mean drowsiness on its own might catch him, or sleep on its own might catch him, it's just a combination that never gets him. Allah didn't say that. He didn't put an end in between them like that. There's a la wa la. If you look at the word or, la ta'khuduhu sinatun aw no. Drowsiness or sleep don't catch him. If he said it like that, which he didn't. Then that actually means drowsiness on its own will never get him. Sleep on its own will never get him. But a combination might, you know, a combination might get him. Because you say, you know, I don't like this by itself or that by itself. But together I might. You see? So the out would have been problematic. Somebody could have p pulled out something and said, hey, but wait a second. I mean, you only negated these things in isolation. You know? But together they may be something else. What did Allah do? لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم And neither. Neither does you know, drowsiness get him, nor does sleep get him. Not by saying neither nor, Allah negated both of them individually and together. Whether they come on their own or they're together, it doesn't matter, it, doesn't, it never gets a hold of it. This is part of the, just the perfection of how Allah Azza wa Jal speaks. You know? يَسْأَلُهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْنِ Everyone and everything actually, in this ayah, everyone is begging Allah, is pleading to Allah for something or another. In the skies and the earth. Who's taking care of the angels? Who's taking care of the jinn? Not just the human beings. Who's taking care of all the creatures of Allah in the skies and in the earth? They're all need, they all need something from Him to continue to survive. Every one of our lives depends on Allah. You know, Recently, I, you know, I met some people whose family was on life support. They were, they were in the you know, um, isolation ward and their family, their family member was on life support. And that basically means now their heart and their, their lungs are being pumped into by a machine. Their lungs don't function on their own. And as soon as you take them off the machine, they're basically dead. And it made me realize something. We're all on life support. Nobody's not on life support. This is, my heart's not beating on its own. Like, the doctor makes you feel like, this machine is making this heart beat. If it was a healthy heart, it would have been beating on its own. Uh, actually, it's never beating on its own. Allah is providing every next beat. Allah is providing every next breath. SubhanAllah. Like, that's how we are alive, because of Al-Hayy. And that's constant caretaking. Nothing is automatic. Nothing is automatic. Every single one of these is an active decision by Allah. Every one of them. Allah didn't create something and just let it go. You know, we think of it like that. You know, you can create a machine like a watch, right? And you wound it up and it's running on its own. Now you don't, the manufacturer doesn't have to keep over the watch. It's just, it's just running its time, its course. So long as the battery is there or so long as the wind up is there, it'll keep running. Allah didn't create us that way. We're not on automatic. We're caught every second of our existence, every cell of our existence, every subatomic particle of our existence is constantly being maintained by Allah. Constantly being maintained. There's not a leaf that falls that Allah is not maintaining. So, every single day He is involved in something, something or another. So, this, these two statements now, just to summarize, we have to get through nine, I know. But these two statements so far, what have they done? They've made, they've brought me two things. They've made me appreciate Allah as someone that is the object of my love, who I'm going to find peace and contentment in. They've also given me reassurance that Allah is living and that He's the reason I'm alive and that He's going to take care of me and never abandon me because He takes care of, takes care in ways that nobody else can, you know. And anybody else in His place would have been exhausted or burnt out by now. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. 
But now with that closeness to Allah, the beauty of Qur'an is, first He brings you close. Then He puts you at a distance. Then He brings you close. Then He puts you at a distance. Now why would Allah put you at a distance? That sounds bad. No, it's not bad. Because there are two dimensions of my relationship with Allah. One dimension of my relationship with Allah is how close I must be with Him. The other dimension of my relationship with Allah is recognizing how far above me He is. How much more superior to myself He is. You know, Allah to us is the king, but Allah to us is also the best friend. Isn't He? And the relationship He has with me as my king, as my ruler, is different from the relationship He has with me as my friend. A friend is someone you keep close, you can talk to anything about your friend, about anything to your friend. You can turn to your friend whenever you want, you complain to your friend, you cry to your friend. That's what you do with your friend. Do you chill with your king, your ruler? You just, hey, I want to talk to you about something personal. When you're in the presence of a king, you're in awe, you're, you're reserved, you're humbled, you're scared, you recognize the authority. That's a relationship of distance, isn't it? Now the thing is, to, the closest analogy to this, because you know we don't live in a kingdom, so we don't have that kind of situation, but I'll give you a, another analogy. The classroom, the teacher and students. Uh, a teacher has to walk a fine line between being a friend and an authority. If a teacher is constantly a friend, students will eat him or her alive. They will listen to nothing. I've tried it. I used to teach kids and I was a nice guy. It didn't work out. Because when, when you all you do is make jokes, tell stories, jump on the table and you know do a magic trick or something, astaghfirullah al-azim, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. When you do that for a few days and I thought, yeah, I'm going to these kids are going to love me. I'm going to do so much, I'm going to have so much fun with them. So when time comes to teach, they will listen to what I say. And I walked in, I was inexperienced as a teacher. I was my third grade class. And I, would, I did all kinds of crazy stuff. And they're laughing and screaming and they're clapping when I walked in. I used to get a standing ovation when I walked into class. The principal used to walk, is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're just having a good time. And like, have you caught up with your lessons? Yeah, this week, this week, inshallah. Just let me just break the ice with these guys. Two days later, I say, I'm going to start teaching them. Hey guys, open up the textbook, page 10. No, do that thing with your ear. Stand on the table again. Tell another scary story. Uh, no guys, it's time to learn now. No, 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 we don't, want, we don't want authority, we want friend. You see? If I give too much friend, what happens? I lose what? I lose authority. If I give too much authority, then the only relationship left is fear. And I lose them as a, as a friend. And if I want my students to be motivated and to feel like they can talk to me about their problems and to connect with me, then I do want them to respect my authority, but at the same time, I do need to be their friend. That's the nature of a healthy relationship because it requires both. Now let's understand what Allah Azza wa is to us, who He is to us. On the one hand, there's no one closer to us than Allah. But if that's all there is, then you get like a little out of hand then people just feel like they can just talk to Allah like they're talking to anybody. Hey, this, that's Allah you're talking to. You've got to maintain who He is. Our, our closeness to Him, our intimacy with Him, our, our, relation, our loving bond and relationship with Him is there, but our awe of Him cannot go away. Our awe of Him cannot go away. You know, the Christians have had this problem for a long time. Especially the Catholics. Because in Catholicism, the grandeur of God was very important. So the, if you look at the Lord's Prayer, for instance, it's very formal in its language. And the Catholic Church decided a few years ago that they wanted to redo the Lord's Prayer to make it more relatable, to bring God closer. And the big debate among the clergy was, no, if you do that, then you're making God too casual. You're bringing Him too close. They can't, you know, the, the text is either going to declare Him as this authority or a friend. What does Qur'an do? So beautiful. Brings you close. And before you get too chummy, listen, you're dealing with Allah. Lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. He alone owns whatever is in the skies and whatever is in the earth. He, you know, think about what he just did. Someone's a take, uh, uh, someone loving, ilah, someone who's alive and takes care, qayyum, that could be anybody. And that could be someone above you and below you, actually. For example, if I, if I were to put this in perspective for you, someone takes care of a garden. 
and they're very careful about every flower. Does that necessarily mean that they are the owner of that garden? Could it be just a gardener who's been hired? Could be, right? Someone who takes care of a child. Does it necessarily mean they're the parent or could it also be a nanny, somebody hired? Could be. Just because you're a qayyum doesn't mean you're an authority. It doesn't. It just means you take care. You provide love, you take care, but now you're not in a position of authority. What does Allah do? Allah takes care of what things? Everything that He owns. See, instead of saying He takes care of everything, He let, let us know everything that exists is actually His own, personal, uniquely His own property. He alone owns whatever lies in the skies and whatever lies in the earth. I will, I will leave a gap here that will fulfill later, but I want to create that gap in your minds. Just because you own what is in the house, doesn't mean you own the house. Think about it. If you own what is inside the house, does that mean you own the house? Aren't there people who rent a house? And they own what is inside the house, but they don't own what? They don't own the house. They don't own the house, you know? So you have now Allah declaring whatever's in the skies and the earth, He owns. But that doesn't include the skies and the earth. It just includes whatever is inside the skies and the earth. So there's a seems to be a gap. What, what about his ownership? Lahu as-samawatu wal ard. The skies and the earth belong to him. Actually, he'll solve that a little later when he says, Was he akursiyuhu? As-samawatu wal ard. In case you were wondering. Well, first he says, whatever is inside it is mine. And by the way, the opposite is also true, isn't it? Just because you own a house, doesn't does it mean everything inside the house is yours? No. You know, uh, give you a simple example. There's airline com American Airlines headquartered here in Dallas. They own planes, don't they? The plane belongs to them. What's inside the plane when passengers are inside it? Does that belong to them too? Do the suitcases belong to them? The laptops belong to them? The phones belong to them? The passengers belong to them? They don't. They don't. Just because you own something doesn't mean you own what is inside it. And just because you own what is inside doesn't mean you own the thing. There's, there's the inside and the outside. What does Allah do in this ayah? In the first part of it, He says, whatever is inside is mine. And then later on, He'll say, by the way, the whole thing is mine. Inside and out. Lahuma fi samawati wa fil ard. And later on, wasi'a kursiyuhu as samawati wa ard. You with me so far? Okay. So now, about this ownership. Wahunaka farq. بَيْنَ مَنْ يَقُومُ عَلَى مُلْكِهِ وَمَنْ يَقُومُ عَلَى مُلْكِ غَيْرِهِ Amazing. There's a difference between someone who takes care of what they own and someone who takes care of somebody else's property. I'm asked, for example, to take care of a project that I started. I'm responsible to take care of a project that I started. I will take care of it a certain way. If I ask somebody else, could you take care of this for me? Will they bring the same passion, dedication, energy, enthusiasm, know-how even to that same project? No. The way you take care of your own house, is somebody else going to ever take care of your house that way? The way you take care of your car, the way you take care of your kids, can anyone else take care of your kids that way? The way you take care of your body, can somebody else take care of your body that way? You never take care of something that doesn't belong to you the same way as when you take care of something that belongs to you. Allah says He's the caretaker. Then He let us know that everything He takes care of actually also belongs to Him. So the care He brings to it is the care of an owner. Not care of some, like it belongs to somebody else, I don't care about it. It's His own. So He brings this personal care to it. فَهَذَا الْأَخِيرِ قَدْ يَغْفَلْ عَنْ مُلْكِ غَيْرِهِ أَمَّا الَّذِي يَقُومُ عَلَى مُلْكِهِ لَا يَغْفَلْ وَلَا يَنَا وَلَا تَأْخُلُهُ سِنَا وَلَا نَوْمُ سُبْحَانَهُ The one who owns, takes care of somebody else's property could become neglectful. There are people who rent a house, don't take care of it, destroy it actually. They don't care. Or you go to a hotel room, you, like, that's okay, the cleaning crew will come. <laughs> Let me make as much of a mess as I possibly can. You know. Who cares? Blast the AC. So what if the whole thing shuts down? <laughs> or what people do with rental cars, that's the fun part, right? Let's floor this thing. You know, let's do donuts in the parking lot or something. So when you do that, you, it's, it's a lack of neglect because it doesn't belong to you. But the opposite needs to be understood too. Is it true that you really care to take care of everything that you own? I mean, go inside your house, there are lots of things that you own that you don't care for. 
that you haven't maintained, neglected, even looked at for ages. Just open your fridge. There's stuff there from the dinosaur age. Like there's, you know, there are things you overlook. You just, you own it, but you don't care. You don't care. Allah is letting us know He's a unique owner. Everything He owns, He cares for. Every, and He doesn't just casually care for. Al-Qa'im, Al-Qayyum. He goes out of His way to take care of it. He goes out of His way to take care of what He owns. What happens with us, by the way, is let's just say you have two cars. One really nice car and one old car. Which one are you going to take care of? Nice one. Because, I mean, it brings you more benefit. It's a nicer car. It's more expensive. What is more used to you? What is more valuable to you? What brings you more joy, benefit, will get more of your attention. And things that don't, won't. Imagine if Allah worked that way. The slaves that worship Him, take care of His requirements, do as He says, He takes care of them. And the ones who forget about Him, He says, well, you forgot about me, I'll forget about you. He's al qayyum over everything that He owns in the skies and the earth. So now, this statement also, we shouldn't overlook it. Skies and earth. I want you to just think about what has been said. He owns everything in the skies and the earth. Now that we're in this day and age, we are more familiar with this phrase than may perhaps ever in history. We know now how insignificant this planet is in comparison to the universe. We don't even amount to a speck in comparison to what Allah calls the skies. If Allah just said the skies or the universe, the earth is included. The earth is included. But He goes out of His way to highlight of all this infinite vast space that He maintains and takes care of, that He owns entirely, and He owns every planet, every galaxy, every star, you know, every black hole, all of it He owns. But then He goes out of His way to say, and I particularly own everything on the earth. He didn't highlight the moon, the sun, he didn't highlight any, he highlighted the earth. And the reason he highlighted the earth is because this relationship began with love. Allahu la ilaha illahua. Allah is now letting us know that he has expressed a special form of his care and his love. And he's brought life onto this earth like he brought nowhere else. And he brought attention to this earth like he brought nowhere else. He maintains the entire sky and especially the earth, I would argue. The mention of the earth here is significant. Compared to the universe, it's nothing, and yet Allah goes out of His way to take care of it. You know, in the way that He does. Now, uh, just about um, perspective. Actually, no, hold on to the thought on perspective. We'll get to that when we get to the kursi of Allah. There's lots to go through here. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُوا عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who is going to be the one, I'll give a bad translation first. Who's going to be the one who will intercede or make a case before Him except by His permission? Who's going to come, let me put that in simple English now. Who's going to come in front of Allah? Who out there, who dare, come in front of Allah and say, Ya Allah, I want to I wanna speak on behalf of this one who's in trouble. Could you go easy on him please? Because he's with me. Who's going to speak like this before Allah and speak on your behalf? Except by his own permission. Unless he gives the permission. This is a statement about the next life. Nobody needs shafa'ah in this, in this life. This idea of speaking on somebody else's behalf, getting them out of trouble. When will humanity be in trouble? When we're standing in front of Allah. When judgment day begins. So this switch has happened now. We've gone on from this life to the next life. And I need you to first understand the benefit of this switch. Why this time travel has happened. That is the day when everybody will truly realize what it means. What la ilaha illahua means. Allahu la ilaha illahua. Today there are people who doubt it. There are people who don't believe in it. On that day, no doubt will be left. Everybody who stands on that day will accept wholeheartedly, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa. That day they will realize how much Allah is al hayy because they will all have tasted death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ أَفَإِمْ مِتَّفَهُمْ خَالِدُونَ We never allowed for any creature before, any human being before you, the Prophet is told, that they get to live forever. You're gonna die and they're gonna live? Allah says to his Prophet, I love you so much, I'll still give you death. And you think, they think they're going to live forever? You know? And then he says, He's the one who gives death. He's the one that gives life. Everyone on this earth is going to cease to exist. Every one of us is going to experience death. Then every one of us will experience life again. And then we will truly realize that the only truly living is Allah. 
Like we haven't experienced death yet. So we can't really taste the true power of al hayy And then we will tra- realize how Allah took care of us. The people will de- declare on that day, قَالُوا رَبَّنَا أَمَتَّنَا ثْنَتَيْنِ وَأَحْيَيْتَنَا ثْنَتَيْنِ فَأَتَرَفْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا فَهَلْ إِلَىٰ خُرُوجَ مِنْ سَبِيلِ Master, you gave us death twice. You brought us back to life twice. We admit our sins. Is there any way out? Any possible way out? Even on that day, Al-Qayyum, how he maintains, how he, you know, right now he takes care of our heartbeats, he takes care of our breaths, he takes care of our life, he takes care of the sun, the moon, the, you know, the air around us, all of it. That day Allah will show you his, his, you know, it won't be an unseen matter. It won't just be you have to ponder and reflect and then realize how Allah is taking care of you. Allah will establish how, how much authority He has on you on that day. لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن الله الرحمن. Nobody gets to speak that day. لا تملك نفس لنفس شيئا. Nobody has authority over anybody else. لا يملكون شفاعة إلا من اتخذ عند الرحمن عهدا. Nobody has any authority to speak and make a case for somebody else except the, you know, the one who had a, a promise with Allah. This, now I wanted to sh- share with you something about the concept of shafa'ah and then I wanted to share with you the, the incredible hadith about shafa'ah. The concept of shafa'ah, the concept of intercession is as follows. Uh, again, by way of analogy, things become easier to, to grasp. Uh, I'm an employer, I hire people at a job and I have a, some employees that I really trust. My manager, I really trust him. And my manager has a cousin who's looking for a job. So the manager says, hey, I'll get you a job here, don't worry. I trust my manager. And he asked me, could you hire this kid? I'm like, okay, I'll hire him, no problem. I take your word for it, it must be good. Then this kid comes into the job because his uncle shoot him in, doesn't take his job seriously, shows up late every day, doesn't finish his work, you know, complains about how hard the job is and how he doesn't get a raise and all of it. Then he's in trouble and I'm about to fire him. And as I'm about to fire him, who steps in? Uncle steps in, says, wait, wait, hold on, he's with me, just give him another chance. Just give him another chance. Now the thing is, that kid is being shielded from me by someone in between, the manager, his uncle, right? So in that kid's mind, he doesn't have to make me happy. In that kid's mind, who does he have to make happy? His uncle. So long as uncle's happy, I'll be fine, because even if I get in trouble, He'll get in the way. I don't have to, you know, corrupt governments around the world, Pakistan. <laughs> uh, you don't have to pay the taxes, you just have to be good with the governor. You just have to good, be good with the officer, you know, the, the, the tax collector or whoever. You're good with him, he'll take care of the rest. You don't have to worry about the law or the authorities, you just have to have, know the right connections. People do this in everything in life to get away with, get away with trouble get away with what they're doing. Have somebody in the middle who'll take the hits for you. This disease of not taking accountability for yourself is brought then into religion. Shaitan brings it into religion. You're gonna stand in front of Allah. You're gonna have to answer Him yourself. Man, I wish I had someone in the middle who could say, I know he messed up, but he's with me. Could Jesus do that? Maybe that'll, that'll help. You know, in, 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 in a lot of the denominations of Christianity, as, as you, can, you can sugarcoat it all you want. Now that Jesus have, has you saved, the floodgates to sin have opened. Because no matter how much you mess up, you can go back to who? Not God, but who? Jesus. And if God says, they disobeyed me, they killed, they stole, they, 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 but they had me in their heart. That should be good enough. This is shafa'ah. Somebody will come, and speak on my behalf, because Isa is so close to Allah, and Allah loves him so much, that on his behalf, he'll just let them slide. This concept then makes its way into the Muslim mind. Um, it could be some, pe- people are now going to different mazars, and like different grave sites, and you know, saintly people, godly people that died a long time ago, and they'll go there, and they'll pray to them, and ask them, because... I can't ask Allah, I messed up way too much, but this data sub over here, this one, can, when judgment day comes, he'll stand in, in the way, he'll take care of me. I just got to make sure that I put enough like milk and you know agarbatti in front of him 
and I'm going to be fine. Then, then I don't have to answer before Allah. You know, it's a it's a way out of standing in front of Allah. These are the very these are the same. They're not. And if you say, oh, they're doing shirk, astaghfirullah, they're doing shirk, that's haram. You know, you only ask Allah. That's you don't you don't understand the problem. That's not the problem. Their problem isn't that this is shirk. Their problem is they don't want to answer to Allah's authority. Allah declared something haram. Allah declared something wrong. They want to do it. And they want to do it, and they don't want to deal with God. They don't want to deal with Allah. So they put these people in between, so they don't have to deal with Allah. That's what, this, this is a sick psychology of getting away, with, getting away with your crimes. That's what that is. Allah declares, who dares to speak in front of me? Man dhalladhi. Allah didn't say nobody will speak in front of me. That's negation. But this is akhrajahu makhraj al istifham al inkari li annahu aqwa min al nafi. This is a form of who's gonna speak? Huh? Who wants to make excuses? Like this is like Allah threatening and challenging. Notice we started with love, but our God is not all love. There's authority too, and with authority comes questioning. So when he owns the skies and the earth, now his authority is established. And now the transition happens in the ayah perfectly into his authority. Let's see who will speak. Let's have your shufa'a. You know, هَؤُلَاءِ shufa'auna عِنْدَ Allah. These are the people that are going to speak on our behalf in front of Allah. Manda, the word manda, ihtimalan, kama yathkur ahlun nahu. There's two possibilities of the word manda, like manzaladi. فَقَدْ تَكُونُ كَلِمَةً وَاحِدًا بِمَعْنَى مَنْ إِسْتِفْهَمِيَا لَكِنْ مَنْ ذَا أَقْوَى مِنْ مَنْ مَنْ could be, مَنْ ذَا could be one word which actually means who dare there's a who will speak and who will speak this is the second one that's when you add a ذا the other could be مَنْ ذَا the ذا is اسم الإشارة which means who anyone like Allah is looking for someone to point at who do you want to point at from ذَلِكَ or from هَذَا that ذَا so now I want to share with you two narrations that are um, just so powerful. The Prophet is describing that day and the shafa'ah. Because Allah says, Illa bi idni, except by His permission. Except by Allah's permission. Nobody gets to speak. Even Quran says, La yatakallamun, they're not going to be talking. Illa man adhina lahu rahman, except someone who Ar Rahman has given permission to. Who is that one? that Ar-Rahman has given permission to when no one on, on human, of all, all of the sea of humanity gets to speak. He says, أَنَا سَيِّدُ النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The Prophet says, I am the leader of all humanity on the day of resurrection. وَهَلْ تَدْرُونَ مِمَّ ذَلِكَ And ha- do you have any clue what that's going to be like? يَجْمَعُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ فِي صَعِيدٍ وَاحِدٍ Allah will be gathering the first and the last, the earliest, the most historical of human beings, and the most recent of all human beings, all together in one large barren field. يُسْمِعُهُمُ الدَّاعِي وَيَنْفُذُهُمُ الْبَصَرِ And then a caller will actually be speaking to them, and their eyes will be petrified. وَتَدْنُ الشَّمْسِ And the sun will be brought near. فَيَبْلُغُ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْغَمِّ وَالْكَرَبِ And as the sun is brought lower and lower, it will reach people and it will d- d- disturb them and it will overwhelm them. مَا لَا يُطِيقُونَ وَيَحْتَمِلُونَ In a way that they cannot bear. They just can't handle it. فَيَقُولُ النَّاسِ People will say, أَلَا تَرَوْنَ مَا قَدْ بَلَغَكُمْ Haven't you, Aren't you seeing what's reached you? أَلَا تَنْظُرُونَ مَنْ يَشْفَعْ لَكُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Can you not find anybody to look at? Who can we look at? Who can we find that will speak on our behalf to, the, to, to your master? فَيَقُولُ بَعْضُ النَّاسِ لِبَعْضُ So people, some of them will say to others, عَلَيْكُمْ بِآدَمْ Go run to Adam, our, our dad. Because maybe, because he's the first one Allah created. Allah loves him so much. And He didn't even create him for earth. He made him in Jannah. Let's go to him. فَيَأْتُونَ آدَمْ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ So they'll come to Adam alayhi salam. فَيَقُولُونَ أَنْتَ أَبُوا الْبَشَرِ They'll say to him, You are the father of all humanity. خَلَقَكَ اللَّهُ بِيَدِهِ Allah made you with his own hand. وَنَفَخَ فِيكَ مِنْ رُوحِهِ And he blew into him of, your, of, of his ruh. وَأَمْرَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ فَسَجَدُوا لَكَ and he, and he commanded the angels and they all bowed down because of you. إِشْفَعْ لَنَا إِلَى رَبِّكَ Could you please speak to Allah for us? You're, you're our dad, just put in a good word. أَلَا تَرَى إِلَى مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ Don't you see what kind of trouble we're in? Don't you see where we're headed? The sun keeps getting closer and closer. أَلَا تَرَى إِلَى مَا قَدْ بَلَغَنَا 
Don't you see what's already reached us? فَيَقُولُ Adam. Adam alayhi salam speaks, إِنَّ رَبِّي قَدْ غَضِبَ الْيَوْمِ غَضَبًا My master today, he's already angry today, like in, in a way, لَمْ يَغْضَبْ قَبْلَهُ In a way that he's never been before. مِثْلَهُ Nothing like it. Allah has never been angry like this day ever before. وَلَنْ يَغْضَبْ بَعْدَهُ مِثْلَهُ And he will never ever after this be angry like this ever again. وَإِنَّهُ قَدْ نَهَانِي عَنِ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَصَيْتُهُ He had told me a long time ago to stay away from the tree. And I disobeyed him. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. All I can think of is myself, myself, myself. اِذْهَبُوا إِلَى غَيْرِي Go somewhere else. Don't talk to me. Don't tell me to speak to Allah. I don't care about you. I only care about who right now? Myself. I, I'm in trouble for the tree. Myself. 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 You hear me? Go talk to somebody else. اِذْهَبُوا إِلَى نُوحٍ Go to Nuh. فَيَأْتُونَ نُوحًا So they'll go to Nuh alayhi salam. فَيَقُولُونَ يَا نُوح They're going to speak to Nuh and say, Nuh, إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ أَوَّلُ الرُّسُلِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ You are the first of the great messengers spent, sent to the people of the earth. وَقَدْ سَمَّاكَ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا And Allah called you an extremely grateful servant. Allah praised you in the Qur'an. إِشْفَعْ لَنَا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ Could you please speak to our master for you? You know, speak to him. Speak to your master for us. أَلَا تَرَىٰ إِلَىٰ مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ Don't you see the situation we're in? فَيَقُولُ إِنَّ رَبِّي عَزَّ وَجَلْ قَدْ غَضِبَ الْيَوْمِ He says, my master today, I tell you, there's no doubt, he is angry today with a kind of anger. لَمْ يَغْضَبْ قَبْلَهُ مِثْلَهُ وَلَنْ يَغْضَبَ بَعْدَهُ مِثْلَهُ That he's never been like this, this angry before and he will never be this angry ever after. وَإِنَّهُ قَدْ كَانَتْ لِي دَعْوَةٌ دَعْوَتُهَا عَلَىٰ قَوْمِ 950 years I preached this one time I prayed against my people. Couldn't take it anymore. Innahum, you know, Allah says, you know, Allah says uh, in Surah Nuh, He describes about them. You know, uh, don't leave anyone on this earth, none of the disbelievers. Innaka in if you were to leave them, if you spare them, they will they will actually disobey you. You know, walan yadu illa fajran kafara. You know, yudillu ibadak, walan yadu illa fajran kafara. They will they will misguide your slaves. And they will not give birth to anyone except who's disbelieving themselves and a sinner themselves. These people have no hope. I've seen many generations of them come up. They're hopeless. Ya Allah, don't spare any of them. Yeah, I remember that one time I made that one dua against my nation. I need to stop here because like Nuh alayhi salam is terrified that he prayed against the people that made fun of him for 950 years, who made fun of Allah, who disbelieved. These are the worst. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا هُمْ أَظْلَمَ وَأَطْغَى Nuh alayhi salam's nation, Allah makes a list of nations that were bad, and then when he gets to Nuh's nation, he says they were the ultimate bad ones. Like, like ain't nobody bad like them. That's what he says in the Qur'an. And Nuh alayhi salam prayed against them how many times? Once. And he's horrified. What do Muslims do today about nations we don't like? In Taraweeh. You pray against nation. Ya Allah, destroy these, destroy those. You know, like damir Amrika asqit ta'iratihim. Destroy America, down their planes. I've heard these in prayers. I'm like, do you not know what Nuh alayhi salam said? You think any anybody today is worse than the nation of Nuh alayhi salam? He's worried. He made dua against them how many times? Once. Watch it. Don't make dua against nations. Make dua for relief. Make dua for justice. Make dua that Allah gives, you know, brings Muslims peace. But not like what we've done is it's so far from our deen. Then he says, Nafsi, 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 ya, myself, myself, myself. I don't care about anybody else. Idhabu ila ghayri. Go somewhere. Go talk to somebody else. Idhabu ila Ibrahim. Go to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Fayatuna Ibrahim. So they come to Ibrahim. Humanity comes to Ibrahim. Ya, the sun is getting closer. Please help. So they go to Ibrahim alayhi salam. فَيَقُولُونَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ أَنْتَ نَبِيُّ اللَّهِ Ibrahim, you, you are the Prophet of God. By the way, when you read this hadith, they go to Adam, they go to Nuh, they go to Ibrahim. You think they're like standing next to each other? They're like, oh, move on to next stall. Move on to next stall. Next please. You think that's what's happening? How many people are standing? The entire sea of humanity is standing together. All of them. 
When there's a couple of hundred people, I have to find one person. Is that easy? Humanity is searching. And they find Ibrahim. They, ser- they find Nuh. And he says, no, you need to go find Ibrahim. Then they're desperately looking. Where is Ibrahim? Where is Ibrahim? And is anybody going to even speak? <laughs> this is bef- By the way, this is before the no speaking starts. This is the first desperation. And so they're, everybody's in chaos and they're looking for Ibrahim alayhi And they find him, Anta Nabiullah, you are the Prophet of God, wa khaliluhu and his dear friend. Min ahlil ard, from among the people of the earth, Allah called you his friend. Ishfa' lana ila rabbika, ala tara ila ma nahnu fihi. Make a case for us, speak on our behalf to your master. Don't you see the situation we're in? فَيَقُولُ لَهُمْ إِنَّ رَبِّي قَدْ غَضِبَ الْيَوْمْ غَضَبًا لَمْ يَغْضَبْ قَبْلَهُ مِثْلَهُ My master today has a kind of anger that he's never shown before. وَلَنْ يَغْضَبَ بَعْضَهُ مِثْلَهُ And he's never going to show this kind of anger ever again. وَإِنِّي قَدْ كُنْتُ كَذَبْتُ ثَلَاثَ كَذِبَاتِ I lied three times. To make a point, even though this was Allah, Allah you know, prescribing to him that he should do this, he feels bad. He says about the sun, this must be God. The moon, this must be God. The star, this must be God. And he was doing it to demonstrate the stupidity of shirk. But he says, but I still said it, didn't I? I can't stand in front of Allah. I can't, I can't go to speak on anybody else's behalf. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I'm not even going to translate that anymore. Basically, that's the most powerful way of saying, I don't care. Go somewhere else. Idhabu ila ghayri. Idhabu ila Musa. Go somewhere else. Go to who? Musa alayhi salam. Fayatuna Musa, fayakulun ya Musa, anta Rasulullah, faddalak Allahu bi risalatihi, wa bi kalamihi, ala nas. Musa, you are the messenger of Allah. Allah gave you such a great preference by His message, the Torah to you. And He spoke to you directly over all other people. He chose to speak, to speak to you. Kallam Allahu Musa taklima. Ishfa' lana ila rabbika la tara ila ma nahnu fi. Make a case, please. Don't you see what the situation we're in? Same exact answer. Inna Rabbi qad ghadib al yawm ghadaban lam yaghdab qablahu mithlahu wa lan yaghdab ba'dahu mithlahu. My master is angry today like he's never been and like he will never be. Wa inni qad qataltu nafsan lam umar bi qatliha. And I have previously killed someone I wasn't allowed to. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Remember when you punch someone? Don't bother me. It's all about me right now. Idhabu ila ghayri, idhabu ila Isa ibn Maryam. Go away. Go, go to Isa, the son of Maryam. Jesus, the son of Mary. فَيَأْتُونَ Isa. They come to Isa. فَيَقُولُونَ يَا Isa أَنْتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَكَلِمَتُهُ Isa, you are the messenger of Allah and you are his word. Allah calls Isa salam, his word. وَكَلِمَةٌ مِّنْهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمْ The word that Allah had given to, dropped onto Maryam. وَرُوحٌ مِّنْهُ And you are a spirit from Allah. وَكَلَّمْتَ النَّاسَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيًّا You spoke to people even as a baby. إِشْفَعْ لَنَا إِلَى رَبِّكَ You, please, make a case to, uh, to our master for our, on our behalf. أَلَا تَرَى إِلَى مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ Don't you see what, I've been, what situation we're in? فَيَقُولُ عِيسَى إِنَّ رَبِّي قَدْ غَضِبَ الْيَوْمْ غَضَبًا لَمْ يَغْضَبْ قَبْلَهُ مِثْلَهُ قَطْ وَلَنْ يَغْضَبَ بَعْدَهُ مِثْلَهُ Same answer. Allah is angry today like He's never been and like He will never be. وَلَمْ يَذْكُرْ ذَنْبًا It'll be interesting. He didn't mention any sin. Everybody else said, nafsi, 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 after admitting a sin. Isa alayhi didn't mention any sin. But it's really cool that Isa alayhi didn't mention any sin. Isa alayhi salam's, the, the thing that scares him the most, what scares him the most, is not what happened on the earth. What scares him the most is what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. Because so many people will think that who's going to speak? Isa will speak. And Allah is angry at those who falsely thought Isa will, is his son who speaks on that day. He doesn't want to touch that. He, he doesn't even bring up anything else. He just says, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I'm just worried about myself. I'm not worried about any of you. It's myself, myself, myself. Idhabu ila ghayri, idhabu ila Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa Go somewhere else. Go to Muhammad. Fayatuna Muhammadan. They come to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Muhammad, anta Rasulullah wa khatimul anbiya. You, Muhammad, are the Messenger of Allah, the seal of all the Prophets, the conclusion of all the Prophets. وَقَدْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ And Allah has forgiven all of any mistake you even would have made, what happened before, what came after. إِشْفَعْ لَنَا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ أَلَىٰ تَرَىٰ إِلَىٰ مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ Could you please intercede on our behalf? Don't you see the situation we're in? فَأَنْتَلِقُوا فَآتِي تَحْتَ الْعَرْشِ I will march forward and I will come right under the Arsh of Allah. 
the grand throne of Allah. فَأَقَعُوا سَاجِدًا لِرَبِّي عز وجل. And I will fall into sajda before my master, the owner of all glory and the owner of all authority. ثُمَّ يَفْتَحُ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ مِنْ مَحَامِدِهِ وَحُسْنِ الثَّنَاءِ عَلَيْهِ شَيْئًا Then Allah will open up to me. In other words, Allah will inspire me with a way of praising Him and a, a beautiful way of describing Him that has never been given to anybody before. Allah will give him new revelation that day. A way of praising him that has never been revealed ever before. Lam yaftahu ala ahadin qabli. It has never been opened up. That secret has never been opened up to anyone other than me before. Thumma yuqal, Ya Muhammad, irfa' rasak. Then it will be said, Muhammad, raise your head. Sal, tu'ta. Ask, you'll be given. Ask and you will be given. Washfa, tushfa. And you make a case. And your case will be accepted. You plead on people's behalf, and I'll accept your plea. فَأَرْفَعُ رَأْسِي I will raise my head. فَأَقُولُ أُمَّتِي يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي يَا رَبْ Three times. My people, Ya Rabb. My people. My people. My Ummah. My Ummah. My Ummah. What were the three repeated words of all the Prophets? Nafsi. 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 Our Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ummati, Ya Rabb. Ummati, Ya Rabb. Ummati. فَيُقَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَدْخِلْ مِنْ أُمَّتِكَ مَنْ لَا حِسَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ الْبَابِ الْأَيْمَنِ أَيْمَنْ مِنَ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ Muhammad, you allow the pass for the entry of you, from among your nation, those who have no hisab on them, no accounting on them, from the most right door of the doors of Jannah. وَهُمْ شُرَكَاءُ النَّاسِ فِي مَا سِوَى ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْأَبْوَابِ and they will participate, they will become one with the people who are from other doors, meaning the farthest door, the last door of Jannah, even those I'll let you I'll let your people in from your people. فَقَالْ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ إِنَّمَا بَيْنَ الْمِصْرَعِينَ مِنْ نَصَارِيعِ الْجَنَّةِ كَمَا بَيْنَ مَكَّةَ وَحَمِيرٍ أَوْ كَمَا بَيْنَ مَكَّةَ وَبُصْرَةَ And he says one door to the next is like this distance of like two different cities, Mecca and and uh, you know Basi uh, Hamir or Busra. But there's another narration I want to share with you along the same lines that's longer. And that completes the story. Because the way Allah speaks to the Prophet Ishfa' lana ila rabbik. People will come. They'll come to Adam and say, please speak on our behalf. Lastu laha. He will say, I'm not qualified for it. I wasn't made for that. I'll translate it this way. I wasn't made for that. Walakin alaykum bi Ibrahim. Go to Ibrahim. Fa'innahu khalilur Rahman. He's the friend of our Rahman. Fa'yatuna Ibrahim. Fa'yakul lastu laha. He'll say, Ibrahim will say, what? I'm not made for that. That's not for me. وَلَكِنْ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمُوسَى فَإِنَّهُ كَلِيمُ اللَّهِ فَيَأْتُونَ مُوسَى فَيَقُولْ لَسْتُ اللَّهَ Then he'll go to Musa, this, the one who speaks to Allah. Musa will say, I'm not, that's not for me. I am not for that role. I'm not fit for that role. وَلَكِنْ عَلَيْكُمْ بِعِيسَى فَإِنَّهُ رُوحُ اللَّهِ وَكَلِيمَتُهُ They go to Isa, what does he say? لَسْتُ اللَّهَ I'm not made for that role. وَلَكِنْ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمُحَمَّدْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ فَيَأْتُونَنِي Ana laha, I will say. I am made for that. I am for that role. فَأَسْتَأْذِنُ عَلَىٰ رَبِّي فَيُؤْذَنُ لِي I will go seek permission to speak before my master and permission will be granted to me. وَيُلْهِمُنِي مَحَامِدًا أَحْمَدُهُ بِهَا لَا تَحْبُرُنِي الْآنِ And he will inspire me with a way of praising him that does not come to me now. It's not something for me now, it will only be for me. Then, فَأَحْمَدُهُ بِتِلْكَ الْمَحَامِدِ Then I will praise him with the words that he's given me. وَأَخِرُّ لَهُ سَاجِدًا I will fall before him in sajda, in prostration. فَيُقَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ إِرْفَعْ رَأْسَكَ It'll be said, Muhammad, raise your head. وَقُلْ يُسْمَعْ لَكَ Speak, you will be heard. وَسَلْ تُعْطَى Ask, you'll be given. وَشْفَعْ تُشْفَعْ Make a case for your people. Make, make intercession. Intercede. And your intercession shall be granted. فَأَقُولْ يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي أُمَّتِي He says, my master, my people, my people. فَيُقَالْ انطلق. Go ahead. فَأَخْرِجْ مِنْهَا مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالَ شَعِيرَةٍ مِنْ إِيمَان مِنْ إِيمَانٍ Allah says to him, go ahead, pull out from the day of judgment. Sun is getting closer, remember? Pull out from these people. Whoever had even a, like a hair split, like a fine hair worth of any faith. They had this much iman, let them come. Let them come. Talk about weak iman. Your iman is like a hair. That's just let him go. And so he says, Ya Muhammad. And so when he does that, فَأَنْتَلِقُ فَأَفْعَلْ So I'm going to go forward and do that. ثُمَّ أَعُودُ Then I'll come back to Allah. 
Rasulullah does this and he comes back to Allah. And I'll start praising him with that praise that he taught me. And I'll fall into sajda before Allah again. فَيُقَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدِ ارْفَعْ رَأْسَكَ Muhammad, raise your head. قُلْ يُسْمَعْ لَكَ Speak. You'll be listened to. سَلْ تُعْتَ Ask, you'll be given. وَشْفَعْ تُشْفَعْ Make a case. I'll, I'll accept your case. Make a case. فَأَقُولْ يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي أُمَّتِي Master, my, my people, my people. He already said this, didn't he? Allah already gave him, didn't he? He's not done. He comes back. He asks again. انطلق. فَأَخْرِجْ مِنْهَا مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ أَوْ خَرْدَلَةٍ مِنْ إِيمَانٍ Go. Find anybody who has the amount of one grain of sand or the, the piece that falls off of a seed of faith. خَرْدَلَة Not even a seed. A seed scraping. That little bit. If you find that much iman in anybody, let them come. فَأَنْطَلِقُ فَأَفْعَلُ I will do that and I'll move forward and do that. ثُمَّ أَعُودُ I'll come back to Allah. فَأَحْمَدُهُ بِتِلْكَ الْمَحَامِدِ I will praise him with those praises again. ثُمَّ أَخِرُ لَهُ سَاجِدًا I will fall into sajda before him again. فَيُقَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ إِرْفَعْ رَأْسَكَ Muhammad, raise your head. قُلْ يُسْمَعْ لَكْ Speak. You'll be listened to. وَسَلْ تُعْطَى Ask, you'll be given. وَشْفَعْ تُشْفَعْ Ask on, make a case, plead. Your plead will be heard. Your plead will be heard. فَأَقُولْ يَا رَبْ أُمَّتِي أُمَّتِي He says again, my people, my people. فَيَقُولْ انطلق. Go ahead. فَأَخْرِجْ مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ أَدْنَى 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 مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةِ خَرْدَلٍ مِنْ إِيمَانٍ Go forward and find the smallest piece of the smallest piece of the smallest piece of a grain of sand not the sand the grain of the grain of the grain or the scraping of the scraping of the scraping of any faith any faith not al-iman iman any faith at all فَأُخْرِجُهُ مِنَ النَّارِ I'll get him out of the fire فَأَنْطَلِقُ فَأَفْعَلُ فَلَمَّا خَرَجْنَا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنَسِ the Sahaba who wanted to hear this hadith were not, there were people who never met the Prophet. And they came to Anas ibn Malik to ask this hadith. And when they came to him, he told them this hadith, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe Allah will be that merciful on Judgment Day. And they just couldn't believe their ears, so they, when they were done with Anas, and they'd never heard anything like this, قُلْتُ لِبَعْدِ أَصْحَابِنَا لَوْ مَرَرْنَا بِالْحَسَنْ وَهُوَ مُتَوَارٍ فِي مَنْزِلِ أَبِي خَلِيفَةً So he says, I don't, we should go to Hassan. We should get a second opinion because this is really wild. We should need to, we need to verify this. فحدثناه بما حدثنا أنس. So so حدثنا we we spoke to him. We narrated what Anas told us. فأتيناه فسلمنا عليه. So we came to him. We said salam to him. فأذن لنا. He gave us permission to sit down. فقلنا له يا أبا سعيد. جئناك من عندي أخيك أنس بن مالك أبو سعيد. We came to you from your brother Anas ibn Malik. فلم نرى مثل ما حدثنا في الشفاعة. We've never ever experienced anything like the thing he just told us about شفاعة. من الذي يشفع عنده إلا بيذن. We never heard anything like this. فقال هاي. آها. فحدثنا. So he says هاي. فحدثنا بالحديث. أو حدثنا بالحديث. فانتهى إلى هذا الموضع. So he told us this hadith, but he stopped here. Stopped where? The least of the least of the least of a scraping of a seed of a grain of sand of iman. That's where he stopped. فَقَالْ هَيْ أَهَا لَمْ يَزِدْ لَنَا عَلَى هَذَا He didn't tell us anymore. فَقَالْ لَقَدْ حَدَّثَنِي وَهُوَ جَمِيعًا He told me that hadith too, but he told me the whole thing. مُنْذُ عِشْرِينَ سَنَةً That's been 20 years ago. فَلَا أَدْرِي أَنَسِيَ أَمْ كَرِيهَا أَن تَتَّكِلُ So he told me, that Anas told me the same hadith 20 years ago and it was the whole version, you didn't get the full version guys. And I'm not sure if he forgot to tell you or he was afraid to tell you because you might become too lazy if you hear the rest. So, <laughs> so then he's like, قُلْنَا يَا بَا سَعِيدْ فَحَدِّثْنَا Could you just tell us? Could you just tell us? فَضَّحِكْ So he started laughing. وَقَالْ خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا Human beings were made to rush into things. 
ما ذكرته إلا وأنا أريد أن أحدثكم. I I didn't even mention this thing that I know the whole thing except I wanted to tell you guys. I'm just messing with you. That's why I said I know the whole thing. I wasn't going to keep it from you. حدثني كما حدثكم به. He told me exactly what he told you. وقال ثم أعود الرابعة. But then he added, I will come back a fourth time. Rasulullah says, I will come back a fourth time. In that hadith, how many times he came back? Three times. This is the fourth time. فَأَحْمَدُهُ بِتِلْكَ الْمَحَامِدِ I will praise him with those praises. ثُمَّ أَخِرُّ لَهُ سَاجِدًا I will fall into sajda before him. فَيُقَالُ يَا مُحَمَّدِ ارْفَعْ رَأْسَكْ وَقُلْ يُسْمَعْ لَكْ وَسَلْ تُعْطَهْ وَشْفَعْ تُشْفَعْ And Muhammad will be told, Muhammad, raise your head. صلى الله عليه وسلم And speak, you will be heard. Ask, you will be given. And, and make a case, and the case will be accepted. Make the intercession, and intercession will be accepted. فَأَقُولْ يَا رَبِّ إِذَنْ لِي فِي مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ This time he doesn't say ummati ummati. He says, Ya Allah, just can you give me permission about the case of anyone who said la ilaha illallah? Not anyone who believed la ilaha illallah, anyone who said la ilaha illallah. فَيَقُولْ Allah will say, وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي وَكِبْرِيَائِي وَعَظَمَتِي I swear by my authority, my grandeur, my greatness, my awesomeness. لَا أُخْرِجَنَّ مِنْهَا بَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ I will absolutely, I swear to it, pull out of it. Pull out of what? Mm. By this time, there are already people in hell. Before, pull them, pull them, pull them. This time, pull them from it. Pull them from it, you know. Whoever said La ilaha illallah. Whoever just said it. This hadith is not supposed to make you say, Chalo, iti the chutti hui. I said La ilaha illallah. Khair, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whew. Going to heaven. <laughs> Eventually. Two things I want to share with you. Rasulullah's shafa'a, there's two of them. Rasulullah, when he speaks on Judgment Day, there are two of them. One of them is in Hadith. The other one is in Quran. The one I shared with you is from where? From Hadith. What's the other one? It's in Quran. What is it? Ya Rabb, inna qawm ittakhadu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura. Master, this nation of mine abandoned the Quran. They took the Quran and they left it abandoned. On the one hand, we find the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam speaking on behalf of the Ummah. On the other hand, you find Allah, the Messenger speaking on behalf of those who abandoned his Quran. They abandoned his Quran. And I, this is my own opinion, you don't have to agree with it. There's a reconciliation between these two. In this hadith, we learn about people who had little to no faith. Little to no iman. And of course, Iman is directly related to action. So you can imagine if the Iman is nowhere, where the action is going to be. You can imagine. The language of that ayah though, اِتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا Not هَاجَرُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ They abandoned this Qur'an. They migrated away from this Qur'an. No, they took this Qur'an as something to be abandoned. The literal language is, they took this Qur'an as something to be abandoned. In other words, they did take it. And then they disregarded it. There are people who are brought up today in not religious families. Muslims, but not religious families. They don't, they don't pray, they don't learn much about Islam, you know. Then there are people who actually learn the religion. They learn it. They learn the Book of Allah. They study it. And after studying it, they don't care for it. After learning it, they don't live by it. Those are a special brand of anger from Allah. People who learn His deen and then abandon it. People who took the book and then dropped its seriousness, didn't give it its rights. That's a brand of criminal. There's the neglectful, whose iman was weak, non-existent. But there's another brand of criminal that looks religious. It lo they look like they're people of Qur'an. But they've abandoned Qur'an. That's the one that Allah's Messenger does not speak for. He speaks against. And there's a reason. There's a reason why those people should be spoken against. Because those people, they are seen as the carriers of Qur'an. 
So when they don't live by the Qur'an and their characters become ugly and their examples become horrifying, then they turn a huge generation of people away from the Qur'an ever even getting a chance. They'll look at those people and say, well, <laughs> these are people of Qur'an, look at how they act. Why should I even bother with this book? Look at what it produces. This is what it produces? I want nothing to do with it. This, this, this is that brand of criminal. Okay, now there's a lot left, but I'm going to keep going. But I'm going to be a little more brief, inshaAllah ta'ala. That was man ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'ibnihi. Now the thing is, Allah owns everything, He already said that. He owns everything. He has the complete authority. The idea of ownership means that anything that happened under His watch, He knows it better than anybody else. And that's why, who's going to come speak on His behalf anyway? He already knows everything. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Look, the idea of intercession is a court trial. Okay? Somebody's about to be thrown into jail, somebody comes along and says, Look, listen, I know he stole, but you don't know the background. His family was starving, this was the situation, he's not psychologically well, whatever, whatever, whatever. Let me give the judge a story so that he, the lawyer will be the shafi'a, right? The lawyer will give the backdrop, backdrop story so that he begs for leniency. You can't beg Allah for leniency because you know something the judge doesn't know. Judge, the judge is who? Allah. He knows the case better than anybody else who's going to make the case. He knows exactly what lies ahead of them, what punishments lie ahead of them, what future beholds them, you know, what the future beholds for them, and whatever's behind them. And it's the, the word ma here suggests that there are things that you've done in your past, there are things in yourself, and there are things lying in your future and what, what is right in front of you that you're not even aware of. You don't even remember. He knows it. He knows it. There is no escape except in this religion except directly dealing with Allah. Nobody will come in between. Even that hadith where I mentioned the Prophet ﷺ will eventually pull people out. Right? Whoever just even said La ilaha illallah. Even they just said it. But the idea is they will spend some time where? They will be in hellfire. Innaha sa'at mustaqarran wa muqaman. It's a horrible place to be for a little while or long term. Don't play with it. Don't say at least this hadith is there, now I can, you know. Even Anas was scared for his generation. If I tell this part, they might go, they might misunderstand this and think the Jannah is guaranteed. And if he was afraid for his generation, can you imagine now? Can you imagine what we will do? And we have. We have. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ And they cannot begin to encompass anything at all. شَيْءٍ تَعْنِي أَقَلَّ الْقَلِيلِ They can't begin to understand a single thing about what he knows except for what he wants, or except by his will. Now, this phrase, it's heavy. Allah knows everything about you. يَعْلَمُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Not only do you know nothing to, little to nothing about Allah, you don't know what He knows. You don't know what He knows. I, I can only give you what the imagery of this ayah is. He doesn't say, لَا يَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا مِنْ عِلْمِهِ They don't know what He knows. He says, لَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْئًا مِنْ عِلْمِهِ they cannot encompass, encircle what he knows. The idea of ihata is to go around something. This is a column in front of me over here. If I went around it, I saw all four sides of it. Maybe the back side of it is painted a different color. I don't know that from here. Unless I go the other side, I can't tell. When you look at something, you look at it from your point of view. When you go around, you get the full per perspective. You understand? You're looking at a mountain, you're only looking at this side of the mountain. You don't know what's on the other side of the mountain. Is there a waterfall? Is there a canyon? Is there whatever? You don't know. We sometimes think we know what Allah knows about, about a situation. Uh, a, a, a death of a child. Somebody became sick. War, famine, hunger, catastrophe. We see it with our own eyes. How many perspectives can we see it from? One. These two eyes. This perspective. Allah's knowledge of something is from which perspective? All the perspectives that you have no access to. You have no access to them. You see things from one side and you start complaining. He knows what I'm going through. He knows what we're going through. Why isn't he helping? But you don't know what he knows. You cannot even begin to encompass the other points of view. There's far too many of them for you. لا يحيطون بشيء من علمه they cannot encircle, encompass what he knows. Illa bima sha'a. Which means two things. Except 
whatever he wants and how much he wants. Sometimes he lets you know a little bit, and whatever he lets you know. And also accept by his will. That's the masdariya, the ma masdariya. Meaning, unless he wants you to know, you will never know. There are things he doesn't want you to know. And there's no way. You can complain all you want, dig all you want. There are some things you just will never know. They're not for you. So Allah Azza wa Jal is fully encompassing, which means the idea of shafa'a becomes impossible. Shafa'a means somebody comes and says, let me tell you, judge, what you didn't know about this poor guy. Before you sentence him to life in prison, go easy on him because you didn't know this, this, this in the backstory. Let me convince the jury that they need to go easy on him. Allah says, what are you going to tell me? I know every angle, every point of view. You can't even begin to know, understand how much I know and how, how fully dimensionally I know it. After having said this, this is actually my favorite phrase in the entire ayah. وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُهُ السَّنَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ This is my favorite phrase of the entire ayah. It's so cool. First of all, I told you when he said لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ He owns whatever is in the skies and the earth, what was inside the skies and the earth. Now he's establishing his ownership of what is on the outside. And in doing so, he uses the word kursi which can literally be translated chair, but we don't really know what that Allah means by that. I'll give you some linguistics in a second. But the first thing I want you to know is the first thing, the first time Allah spoke about the skies and the earth, He talked about ownership. Lahu ma fis samawati. He owns whatever's in the skies and the earth. Ownership. Now He's talking about authority. His throne extends. His seed extends over the skies and the earth. So this is actually something else. Ownership versus kingdom. An owner owns small things. A king owns big things. An owner, you can own a pen. You can own a car. You can't own a country. You can be the king over a country. You understand? So if you want to put this in literary perspective, there's micro and macro. Micro means small things. Macro is bigger picture. And someone's a king. Let's say they're a king over an island. Can they keep track of every transaction, every meal, every conversation because that's micro and a king can only handle what? macro, big big picture what about an owner? an owner can take care of the little things but they can never take care of what? big things which one is Allah? Allah in the beginning is owner which suggests that he takes care of what things? the smallest of things but does that mean he doesn't control the whole thing? As you will see, the entire expansive universe that seems so infinite and so overwhelming to scientists today. There are sci- I've, I've watched documentaries on the universe. Man, these people talk about the universe like they're talking about God Himself. It's so amazing. I'm so in awe of it. It just keeps going. It's so expansive. It makes me feel so humble and so little, etc., etc. Like they literally have spiritual moments when they talk about the universe and how big, how huge the universe is. Now put this in perspective. Wasi'a. Translated, it withheld. His, his throne withheld the skies and the earth. Not withholds, but withheld. It's the past tense, not the present tense. Makes a huge difference. I walk into this hall and I say, This holds 300 people. Present tense. This holds 300 people. Does that actually mean there were 300 people in here? Think about it. Somebody shows you a hall and says this holds 400 people. Does that mean there were ever 400 people in there? No. It means it can do it. We don't know if it's ever been used. The present tense opens up the possibility, but doesn't prove that it actually what? Happened. If the present tense was used, Allah would be saying, this kursi of His can hold the skies and the earth, But we're not sure if it does. No, it's already held it. If you walk into a hall and say, this hall held 400 people, then what are you saying? It actually happened. That's the first thing about the past tense. This is actually a case in point. It's a fact. The second, very important. When you say this hall holds 300 people, that means maximum capacity is what? 300. Because if if it could hold more, you would have said it holds 400, 500, 600. You said it holds 300, it means it can't hold 301. It's 300. If I walked into a hall and said, you know this hall held 300 people. Held 300 people. Is there room for more? Yeah. When you use the past tense, 
You didn't use maximum capacity. This place held a thousand people. It could have held ten thousand. It could have. The past tense does not exhaust maximum capacity. His kursi, I don't, the kids imagine like there's a chair and then the skies and the earth are like this ball stuffed under the chair, it's busting out of the seams on the side. It barely <laughs> fit in. Uh, no. Allah contains the skies and the earth under his kursi and much more. Much, and have room for much more. It didn't exhaust maximum capacity. Let's look at the word kursi. Fillughati min al kirs. It actually comes from the word kirs. Wahuwa tajmi. It actually means to bring things together. Wa minhu al kirasa. Wahiya idda tu awraqi awraqi majma'a. Aw awraqa majma'a. It's actually kirasa, which is a pile of papers bunched together. Wa kalimat kursi ustu'milat fillughati bi ma'na al asas al ladhi yubna alayhi shay. The word kursi in old Arabic was used for the foundation on which something else is built. And so. فَمَادَّةُ الْكُرْسِي الْكَافْ وَالْرَاءُ وَالسِّينَ تَدُلُّ عَلَى التَّجْمِيعِ وَتَدُلُّ عَلَى الْأَسَاسِ الَّذِي تَثْبُتُ عَلَيْهَا الْأَشْيَاءِ عَلَيْهِ الْأَشْيَاءِ It's actually the foundation on which things are put together. إِسْنَعْ لِهَذَا الْجِدَارِ كُرْسِيًا Build a kursi for this wall. Means build a foundation for this wall. Put a foundation down for this wall. وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُ The point that the, all of this poetry and everything else is getting at is kursi is something everything else depends on. The foundation is what the building depends on. His kursi is what this entire universe depends on. And his, that dependency extends, like the dependency of the skies and the earth is entirely co covered on the kursi. They can rely on the, on the throne of Allah, the kursi of Allah. Now, there are two degrees. I, the, the English language is kind of limited. You can say kursi is throne, chair, but you know, my, our, our foundation. But there are two things. There's kursi and there's arsh. There's the kursi of Allah and there's the Arsh of Allah. The Arsh is much bigger than the Kursi. The Arsh is separate from the Kursi, it's much bigger. And so I wanted to share with you. Sa'altu al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa kursi. Rasulullah was asked about the Kursi. You know, Abu Dhar Ghafari asked, Ghafari asked him, can you tell me about Al-Kursi? Allah says it, it can withhold the skies and the earth. How, how does it do that? Can you give me some perspective? Ya Abu Dhar, ما السماوات السبع والأرضون السبع عند الكرسي إلا كحلق حلقة ملقاة بأرض فلات فلا. The kursi, if you were to compare it to the entire skies and the earth, would be like a ring thrown in the desert. The kursi of Allah would be the desert, and the entire universe would be what? The ring. Remember what I told you about scientists in awe of how big the universe is? The universe to Allah, the sky, and by the way, that the universe that they're in awe of is one sky. How many skies are there? Seven skies and the earth combined is this ring compared to the kursi. And the kursi of Allah, then he says, Rasul says is not done. وَإِنَّ فَضْلَ الْعَرْشِ عَلَى الْكُرْسِي كَفَضْلِ الْفُلَاتِ عَلَى تِلْكَ الْحَلْقَةِ And the kursi of Allah, compared to the arsh of Allah is that same ring in the desert again. <laughs> the kursi of Allah is nothing compared to the arsh of Allah. The universe is nothing compared to the kursi. The kursi is nothing compared to the arsh. And none of this is anything compared to Allah. That's how insignificant the universe is to Allah. And within that universe, how insignificant is the earth? Not even compared to the seven skies, just to the first. And on that earth is you and me. And within that you and me, how insignificant is one cell in my body? How insignificant is one bone? How incredibly insignificant we are. Now I want you to go back. Remember Allah said He owns everything and He takes care of everything? The smaller something is. You own something that is compared to you, Compared to you, a ring in the desert. Right? <laughs> How easy is it to take care of? Would you even care to take care of it? To zoom in and check on every little detail? How much does Allah go out of His way to take care of you and me? What, and what, he, what is around Him? What He takes care of? وَلَا يَؤُدُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا And when you put this in perspective, what, what is His governance over? What is His governance over? And when you put that in perspective, then you realize how much is he taking care of 
And he's not just taking care of it. Because just because you're taking care of something, doesn't mean you're protecting it. A gardener can take care of the garden, but he can't what? Protect the garden. A cleaner can take care of a house, but can't? Protect the house. Allah is taking care of us, but he's also what? Protecting us. He says, وَلَا يَأُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا يَعْنِي لَا يَصْعُبُ عَلَيْهِ It doesn't exhaust him. بَلَغَ مِنْهُ الْمَجْهُودُ وَالْمَشَقَّةِ It doesn't overrun him. Guarding both of them, the skies and the earth. Taking care of the skies and the earth doesn't take anything from him because it's so insignificant to him. Now that you've put it in some size perspective, <laughs> you've... It just... You, you, the, the greatness of Allah and how... Now imagine... What Allah just did, right? The universe is a ring to the chair. The chair is a ring to the arsh. And that is nothing to what? Allah. How far above He is from us. And yet He protects us. What a great way to end this feeling. وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ He is the ultimately high. You get an idea of how high He is now? He is the great one. You have any clue now how great? <laughs> SubhanAllah. Like... What a way to end it. First he makes you realize how absolutely insignificant you are. And through that you realize how great Allah is. Throughout this ayah, the lesson to be shared, the, the, the thing to remember in this ayah, is actually the more humanity, myself, you, the more we realize our insignificance, our inadequacy, that's the more you will come closer to Allah. The more absorbed in ourselves we are, the further we become from Allah. The way to get close to Allah is to actually find humility before God. Just be humbled by how awesome He is. How incredible He is. I've talked in previous videos about the literary symmetry of this, uh, this ayah. You can look those videos up. I don't want to repeat that in its entirety. I just want to share some of its implications with you. What that, for those of you who aren't familiar, there were how many sentences did I say are here? There are nine. And this forms a very beautiful structure. In the first of these sentences, Allah Azza wa Jal brought us very close. And by the end of it, He's very, very far. You see that? In the first one, Ilah, Al Hay, Al Qayyum, the caretaker. And by the end, there's this Arsh and Ali, Al Ali, Al Azim, high above, the great one. You know? And so both of those dimensions of our relationship have come together. By the first statement and the last statement. If you look at the second statement, he said, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Taking care of us doesn't make him drowsy nor sleepy. And on the other hand, he says, he doesn't get tired by guarding them. There are two tasks, taking care and guarding. By the way, if Allah was only guarding, that doesn't mean He's taking care. And if He was only taking care, it wouldn't mean guarding. You need both. You need both from Allah, both dimensions. Both very distinct relationships we ha He has with us. And for both of them, anybody else who does them gets tired, don't they? Gets sleepy, don't they? So this doesn't exhaust him and that doesn't exhaust him. Here, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم There, لا يأوده حفظهما So the second statement and the second last statement complete each other. There he said, لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ His ownership was established. And whatever's in the universe, I kept bringing this up to you. Whatever is in it, doesn't mean you, if you own what is in it, doesn't mean you own what the whole thing is. And on the other side, he completes the picture, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Yeah, he owns the entire thing. And the entire thing is nothing to him. The entire thing is insignificant. Here he says, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who's gonna speak on his behalf? Except if he gives permission. On the other hand, he tells you, why would it be no point for anybody to speak on his behalf? You, who's going to bring any, any kind of shafa'ah? He already knows the whole case. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ They can't encompass anything of what he knows. They have no clue what he knows. They have no idea that he, he can go far beyond any shafa'ah. And you notice even this in, in this fourth and fourth last statement, the fourth and the sixth statement, you'll find illa. On the one hand, nobody can speak on his behalf, except when he gives permission. You don't know anything, except when he lets you know. Except, except. And then the very middle, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Which is the message of this ayah. He knows what is ahead of them, and he knows what's behind them. Which is incredible, because the, the part ahead of this is completely symmetrical to the part behind it. Right? 
And in the middle he says he knows what is ahead of them and what is behind them. But more than that, before you come to this ayah, there's a life you and I have lived. Maybe a life of neglect, a life that we didn't really give Allah his due. We didn't realize how grand he is, how great he is, or how arrogant we've been. He knows what you were like before, and he also knows what you're going to be like after. Is this going to affect you at all? Is this going to change you at all? يَعْلَمُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ This entire ayah, and this is the last thing I want to share with you, this entire ayah is part of a, um, a, a continuation of ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah. The entire subject of them is life after death. How Allah brings life from death. How we'll be resurrected. And notice this ayah began with what? It began with Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayy al-qayyum. That's the conversation. From the beginning to the end. Go on and on and on. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam will come up. He will ask, كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى How do you give life to the dead? You know? And then Allah will describe, you know, how He brings life to the dead out of the ground. And He'll describe how seeds turn into plants and crops. Life and death, life and death, life and death. Over and over and over again. And so what, what is the spiritual significance of that? In all of the ayat before and after, there were practical lessons. This is the only kind of abstract, metaphysical, imani kind of ayah in all of it. Why? Because Allah is telling us something incredible. He's telling us that hearts can be dead and they can be brought back to life. And Allah Azza wa can bring your heart back to life. And He can, he can connect you to Himself. This is a, what a gift of Allah this ayah is. Sayyid Ayat al-Qur'an, the leader of all the ayat of the Qur'an. May Allah Azza wa Jal make, give us a love and an appreciation of this ayah like never before and allow us to continue to, you know, when we, when we recite this ayah for protection, and you, can, you should recite this ayah for protection, and when you recite this ayah for healing, and when you recite this ayah for blessings, but when you recite, let me tell you, all of those things will happen when you recite with reflection. When you recite Qur'an with reflection, when you think about what Allah is saying, then protection will come, healing will come, Allah will take care, Allah will provide, Allah will fix your affairs. That's what will happen when you recite Qur'an with reflection. We have to abandon the culture where we recite the Qur'an and we think it's going to give us blessings and we don't think about what the Qur'an says. That is not a blessing, that's a curse. I say that boldly, that is not a blessing. If we celebrate a culture in which the Qur'an has nothing to do with reflection and we only want it for its blessings, that is not the reason for which Qur'an came. That is not the reason for which it came. I made it a point to share this particular ayah with you because around the world there are so many Muslims that love Ayatul Kursi that have memorized it as children. They recite it every day. They recite it all the time. What a blessing. We already know it by heart. And if you don't, inshallah, you will soon. But you know, I, I did this as hopefully a gift to some of you that now when you recite it, you have something to think about. You have something to really bring its blessing into your life. So I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal does that for you and for me. And that Allah brings, brings us closer and closest, closer to Him and you know, makes us feel every one of these beautiful declarations and transforms our lives through them. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.